Welcome to lecture number two. Let's get started. Today's uh, theme is functions. So we're going to be writing first simple functions and simple homemade function. Of course, we're going to be looking into different kinds of loops. So basically control statements, also different kinds of apply function. And then we're also going to introduce a different data structure, which is called the list. I'm going to be also ending up with showing some simulation examples, which is pretty much the cornerstone of what you should be able to do at the end of this course. And uh, we keep it pretty simple. And uh, if you're looking for good style, don't look here. It has been improved, I swear, but it still has its flaws here and, there, here and there. So first I'm gonna set my working directory so I don't mess anything up. Let's look at a very simple function I have here first. I have now initiated a function that I call f. So first, before we go any further, what does a function take? What does a function consist of even? It consists in general of three things. It consists of the formals, which is the arguments that needs to go into the function. In the function you see on the screen here, the only formal is x, which means that's the number we put in when we call f. Second, we have the body of the function. That is everything that is inside these curly brackets, as you can see. So this is x squared, which simply means now if I do this right, if I put in f and then 2, call the function, I will return 4 because it becomes x squared inside the function. Basically, put in the machine, wait for the output, that's pretty much what's happening. The final thing is the environment, which is basically just the location of the variable. So for this purpose of this course here, it is just in your global environment that you see down here. There's nothing different about that. We're not going to touch that here. So, But then you know what three things a function consists of. So, well, don't forget that. We can, of course, also call the function up to see, you know, what does each function contain. We can also just check, well, what are the formals for this function? It's just x, gives the return argument here. The same goes for the body and the environment. It will simply just tell us, well, what is the body of the function? What's the environment? So you can call the entire function, you can call the, each of the individual pieces. So that is simply just the most basic function that you can make in R for now. Step one, let's go to step number two. Let's make a little more well, I'll still call it a simple function, but still, it's one step up from before. We're now going to make two functions. First one we call modulo, and the other one modulo.rest. I'm going to run both of these functions. And now let's go for the explanation here. What am I actually doing here? I'm actually just doing integer division and modulus by, you know, I'm mirroring this here you learned last week, which is the percentage sign slash percentage sign or percentage percentage sign which respectively, of course, is integer division and modulus. The way it works, these functions now, starting with the modulo function, it takes two input, x and k, which of course are the two numbers that you need in this case here to perform this division. So if I call the modulo function, put in two numbers here, oh, I actually made some examples here already, that's nice on line 46, everyone. Then of course I can put in five and three. We see how many times three is, uh, well, goes up to five. That's the way I learned at least in Danish. But okay, that was enough Danish for today. So here we see, of course, the model here for this function is just one. And uh, that is how the simple model function would just work. And well, that is what we can see again here. We see that the formals is x and k. We see that the body here is this return statement, which we are simply just asking, please return this number, which is the truncated version here of x divided by k. So it simply just removes any, well, decimal points and gives us the whole number, which here will resemble modulo. And now we can do exactly the same for the rest after this. This should, if my math is correct, equal two. And well, great. And um, the modulo here is one because three goes up to five one time. When you divide these two numbers, it does it by one. So you get uh, actually 1.2 thirds. But of course, when you do this flooring here, it is exactly the same. So Thomas, correct, it's the same as flooring in this case. Why I call the modulo is just to resemble int division. I could also call it int division or something like that to assemble this a little better. And for the return here and for the for x statement here, you can do both in this case here. We see here indeed that there's a return statement in modulo and modulo rest, but not in our symbol x function. 
The return statement here, as we can see here, let me go here and check it out because we have our very neat help function. And every time you have, well, a doubt about how these would work, we can simply just go and see where we would tell the function to return this number. Otherwise, it will simply just return when it's done. So suppose we had multiple things that was happening in a function. Return will simply just tell us at this point in the function, please return this number. And then we can carry on with whatever would be in the function when the function becomes a little more involved. Let me say it like that. So I hope that answers the question I see in the chat for now. Otherwise, well, good morning, Diego, and thanks for joining here in the chat. So I also hope that uh, you guys will also, when you see Diego around, he's also uh, haunting the server together with me and all our TAs. So uh, you can always call him. He is also on the commander on the server. So let's carry on. Now we can, well, before we go on to a little more interesting things here, let's just see how these functions actually work. It's function, it functions the same as integer division and modulus. You can see here, we have just created two homemade functions that actually just resembles this built in our command here. So no, we did not have to make these functions because they weren't quote unquote needed. But this is to show how you can make these simple functions because as you may have seen assignment two already, we're gonna ask you to make a whole lot of functions. And for those who may be interested, at one o'clock the lecture slides will go up here or the lecture script. So once we are done, the lecture script will go up and uh, yeah, just so you know. As you will see here on line 55, the topic for next week will be Wow, I'm not doing very well with this English today. Maybe I just need some uh, some nectar of the gods and I'll continue. Maybe this will improve my English or not. So, so let me see here. Next week's topic is recursive functions. We're going to talk a lot more about that next week. We got a nice question here from 007. And now we see here, when the function already exists in R, do we have to make our own function from the start? The answer is generally no. If the function already exists in R, you can just use it unless we specifically ask you otherwise. Hope that is clear. So let's go down to our first more involved function. And for this here, I'm actually gonna make sure that uh, everything is stated the correct way here. Let's do this here. We have this algorithm to find numbers of prime. This um, erastosis, <laughs> oh my God, I cannot pronounce all these things today. What have I done to myself? But the thing is here, there's a very nice Wikipedia entry that actually will show you how this actually works. So if I've done this correctly now, I should be able to share my screen with you. So I went over to my screen instead now, and then I can show you here, this is how it actually would look. Right, so you will see here, this is how the prime finding algorithm would look if you look it up on just Wikipedia, for instance. So you're all welcome to go and check that one out, but let's explain how that works over in our studio, shall we? So the idea is here, you have from one up to a given number that you define in this function here that we called here. I should never, next time I'm just gonna call it a simple name so I don't mispronounce the whole time. So first we run the entire function here. So we have it stored in here. You see here down our functions here. Now, this function has the formula of just n max, which is just one number. That is up to what number are we checking for primes? So for instance, in this example you saw on the Wikipedia page, it does it for 120, but I can just use it for 100, for instance. But let's explain what it actually does, because this function looks a little more involved than you've seen before. So first thing in the function, it defines all, which all goes from two up until n max, because well, two is the first number we will consider, right? So we start a counter k, and then we say, okay, the starting value is the first position in this all, is in this all var variable, which of course the first position all is equal to two because that's what we defined up here. And then the first thing we do, now we start our first while loop. How does a while loop go? While loop is a loop that keeps running until the condition that is set in the while loop's beginning is no longer satisfied. In this case here, it will run as long as the counter k that we initiated, which is equal to one now, is less than or equal to the square root of n max. So if I put in 100 square root, that will be, quick math, 10. Yes, that, awesome. Then it will run until 10, for instance. What does it do inside the loop? So what's actually happening? You define an exit variable, which is the sequence, and we know all about sequences because you've done that very well in your assignments, where a sequence where we start with start, so that is the first position in all, which is two, it goes up to n max, which was 100 in my example that we're gonna run here. 
and it's going to increase by start, which by start, start being two, so it goes two, four, six, eight, ten, and so forth. Because all these, um, it only so for Anastasia's comment here is very important. I address this very quickly. Anastasia, yes, it checks the end of the loop. Of course, you run everything in once, then it checks the condition, then it runs again and again and again. So it doesn't check immediately, unless of course, if this K already at the beginning here doesn't fulfill, then the loop is just exited. So let's carry on. You define exit, which is of course all the multiples from start that's going to be sieved out. They're going to be well removed from the row of numbers from two to one hundred. Then, of course, we print it here, we override it here, so we figure out which multiples are going to go out except from 2 because 2 is prime. Because the first one here will start by 2, but 2 should not be sieved out because 2 is prime. Therefore, we make this exit here being overwritten here, so we go the same, but without 2. Then we print it. That's optional. You can, of course, comment out if you don't want to see the progress. This line is not important. It'll only show the progress as we go along. And then, of course, we redefine all to be the difference between the initial all and the exit row. So what we have left after we sieved out all these multiples of two. Then we increase the counter and start at a new position in this all. And of course, what is the next number in this all? Well, first it was two. Then the next, then all the two, four, six, eight, ten are sieved out. And now you see, okay, here, hmm, what will be the next one? That will be three in this case. And then now when it looks again, it's going to take out all multiples of three. Let's try just and run it. I put it here with 100 because that's the example I've been going with all the time. So let's run this here. And you see a lot of output very quickly, of course. And for the purpose of print and return here, uh, for print and return here, I'm going to hopefully address that later right now. I'm going to come back to it. So don't worry about that. I'm sorry for Yannick. I know that it is not the answer you want to hear right now. So... Keep it in mind, but first let's just take how this loop actually goes. First, you see here in these three lines here, these are all the multiples of two. That's gonna be that's gonna be all the numbers that is to be sieved out, right? You see all multiples of two. And then you notice here what you see in the next here that prints what is left. And then we do again and again and again and again. And then you see here the final row here, it returns to us what are the prime numbers from 2 to 100. Okay, so what pine? I have a question from the chat here from MV. What part of line 72 says that we should keep the 2? We look here. It says the position of exit. So the second position of exit, right? Because the first position of exit, so that will be a 1 here, that's the number 2. If I'm telling here it starts at the second position, that means we are not taking everything after two, so for position two and onwards, okay? Now, fantastic. I hope that was clear for everyone. You're welcome, M MV. Let's carry on. This is the example of the first, I would say, a little more involved function. I can, of course, also just comment out this print here, reinitialize the function, that's what I want to call it, and run it again, and now it should only give us the final output here. Now I removed this line 73 just to a comment so you can see the process when this comes up and you guys can get the lecture uh, lecture script here you can try it out yourself just to see how it goes but now it has been initialized such that now it will only give us well what numbers are prime between 1 and 100 this is of course a nice algorithm but of course it is far outperformed by more complex algorithms nowadays this is very important if you want to study more about uh, cryptations and these kind of things. That finished the first thing about functions. Let's go on to step number two, which is about system time. We have a little small section here about system time because the question is, how long does it take for your system to run these functions? This is actually over the course of this course here. This is the third computer I'm doing this course on. And I can tell you the first time I ran on my old, old laptop, it would take forever with everything it did. And of course, now the second one was fast enough, but now I got the option here to get a much more powerful one. So it should hopefully be quite fast for these kind of things. System time here would tell you how much time on the CPU is used, so the processor of your computer. Now we can just try here. And of course, there's an already a better package here. I have commented out because I've already installed the package. So you can, of course, just require the package so it is loaded into your environment. So it's ready. And now we can simply just try this micro benchmark here to see, okay, how fast, what is the mean speed of this? 
what is the mean speed of this and what is the upper quantile, lower quantile, or so forth. And um, that's how you can see it here. So you can see we put the expression 100 times. So over 100 times, how fast is it? Let's put the units in seconds a little, so it's a little easy to read what's coming out here. This now is expressed in seconds, which is a lot easier for us to understand. And yes, for Anastasia, yeah, we may be able to optimize a few things here. So we're going to be able to check a look at that. So um, let's check out this here. So this is just a simple example of how long this prime finding algorithm would take, at least on my system. Your numbers may be different because, well, each system is different. So let me know if somebody has exactly the same run times as me. That would actually be fun to know. Or somebody can actually do this faster. That's more important. If you have a computer that's even faster than the one I'm sitting with. So I'm not sitting here that, of course, this is the fastest I have, but hey, it's fast enough for this purpose here. So I've also put some uh, good, uh, what do you call it, good comments here. Suppose you need to increase your memory, then I've also put in the help function for that, and also how you would set your memory size, how much memory is allocated here into our studio when you run your functions. Okay, not too bad. Let's go to the next part here. We're moving forward a lot here. Time for some water here. Okay. Let's do this. We now have the next things here, which are if and while. We already looked at an example of a while statement, right? But let's go for these if else statements. So basically, if this condition is fulfilled, do that. Otherwise, do that. That's basically what if else does for you. For people who have seen, this is very common in basically any program language that you have out there today. Now, here comes my perfect Dutch. We're going to make the least common multiple, which is something like kleinste gemene veel fout in Dutch. So epic bad Dutch from my account, but okay. Let's see here. We can simply initialize the function, which I'm going to call LCM for short. This time I can pronounce it, I swear. What does it do? It takes two inputs, of course, two numbers in this case here, which we will then see in this case here, hey, what is the least common multiple of these two numbers that we have as input? It will then check which one is the greater. So either if x is larger than y, then x is the greater one. Otherwise, y is the greater one. That, that's pretty obvious. So if this condition is true, then the greater is equal to x. If not, then we go over greater equal to y. So far, so good. Okay, let's go for the next thing here. Then we have a while loop. So it says here, while it is true. So basically it says here, until this is no longer true, well, i.e. false, then run the following loop. If this here, and then you have the integer division, then we go back to the what is more percentage percentage sign. That was a function from earlier. Roll up here, percentage percentage is modulus, right? Not integer division, my bad. So if here the modulus of these two numbers here, the greater and x is equal to zero and also for y, then we have found the least common multiple. Otherwise, please continue with the next number in the row, setting greater larger to one. And then once you are done with this loop, the while loop here, then you will return what is the least common multiple at that point in time. I think it's much easier at this point here just to see how this would work. So for instance here, if I go LCM, call the function, I'm going to add in two numbers now, so 7 and 10 for instance. Then those are my two numbers, so x and y. It would then run this function until I found the least common multiple of these two numbers, which should be no surprise, is 70. That's why it stops at 70 here and prints that at the end. So you see it actually starts testing all the way from 11. And it goes all the way up and says to hit 70 and it stops. Because then this while loop here is false at that point, which means that we now return what is currently marked as LCM. Of course, we can also do a little more fun things. This is like first step towards some user interface, but not really, but okay. We can initialize a number from which you can put in the numbers here. So we can initialize here, say, okay, let's put in call this here, enter the first digit that you want to do. So we can ask R to ask for input essentially. So here I have num1, and now I also notice here I need a num2, let's do this correctly here, copy and paste and put this as num2, because we need two numbers of course, it doesn't work if I only put in one number. So you can see here, 
put in here the first number. What is the first integer? Let's just do five this time. Then you see five gets saved in as number one. But now, of course, I got R to ask for the input. And of course, we can do the same here with num two. And what we want to do, number do we want? We can do seven again. Okay, now I have these two and now I can ask it to print, pasting this together here. I did not remove the quotation marks. We could do that, of course. It says here the LCM of five and seven is 35. So now you see, I took the function that we made and kind of made a little more input oriented style to it. Why is this in asking input so important? Let me give you the first hint on the exam from last year, for instance. We asked you exactly something like this. We asked you for input to input in the function that you've previously constructed such that you could generate a game at the end. And now it's funny when Anastasia says tic-tac-toe, that was not the game we made, but we are getting a little, um, we are getting a little closer to what we want here, right? We got another question here from Lindy before we continue. Is it possible that R only gives the final numbers answer instead of all the values? That is indeed true. We can just see instead of having print here, we simply just comment it out like this and that will solve your problem. So I take line 127 and I comment it away. Then it will only show the final value. Because as I put here, if we want to see the progress. Now, it should only give you the final value. So hopefully that would help you, Lindy, at this point here. Let me know if that answers your question. In the meantime, we can of course also go to auto one, auto way around. Yeah, auto way around. I am running low on uh, nectar of the gods. I eat chocolate milk today. Okay. And in Dutch, that will be the grootste gemeene deler. Awesome. I have even forgotten what I would call my own language, but hey, can't remember everything. And you're welcome, Lindy. So this works in a very similar sense. I'm not going to explain this very much in detail, although there's one thing you should notice. Actually, I'm introducing a for loop here, which is very interesting. And thank you for the largest common denominator. Highest common factor could also be, but you are very true. Thank you very much for the input, which I call here, of course, HCF in this case here. Let's initialize the function like we did before, and let's explain a little bit. The beginning is kind of the same as before, but we had greater, now we just do smaller. Which one is the smaller of the two? So if x is larger than y, then y is the smaller one. That's the first part of the if statement. And else, well, then it's x, of course. If it's not y, it's x. And then we run a for loop. And in a for loop, you, of you do the following. You, have initial you initiate a counter, which could be i, k, j, j, l, m, a, b, c, whatever. It's typically just i. You always start with, if you need multiple loops, you will go for J, K, and so forth. And it says here, it goes from one up until smaller. And then you check essentially a similar condition as before. And then you can also, as before, before I get the question, you can comment this one out so you don't see the progress and we only see the final result. Let's this time just go for only the final results. I'm gonna initialize the function again. I, of course, the same way I ask for input, this is similar to before. So what is the highest common uh, of, let's do 42. We know that's the answer to everything. And let's go for another number here as well. Let's say 10. And then we can call the function here, putting it together in line 162. The HCF of 42 and 10 is two. And we got a question here in the in the chat and well Anastasia beat me to it but also so everybody can hear it as well question goes what is a loop essentially and imagine something that just keeps going and going and going well the word looping itself over and over again you have undoubtedly heard this before and now what a for loop does in this case it runs for a given number of times. For instance, when you have a while loop, it runs until a condition is no longer satisfied. You could, with a while loop, run into cases where it runs forever. You can get infinite loops this way because, for instance, if the statement forever would be true, it will run all, all the time. Right? So, I got another question here, and this is from Dan. And then your program crashes. Just put like, I have crashed my computer twice doing class now. I'm not going to make that mistake again. 
That was to a lot of amusement for the students that I crashed my computer twice. Whoops. Infinite while loops. Not a good idea, guys. We got a question from Dan. So in the print function, so that will be here in line 162, I believe. Then we have num1 and num2. Um, how is the HCF or er for uh, LCM contained in this case? Well, when you initialize num1 and 2, you're overriding what was there before. Right? So when you put a new number to be num1, remember how it works here. You have a value that we put in that gets pointed to this name. So now you're overriding this reference. So num1 now will refer to the new number you put in instead of what we used before for the LCM. I hope that answers Dan's questions, or Dan's questions, sorry for that. Let me know if uh, it's clear otherwise. Uh, ah, fantastic. Then we have a few more things. I know this is kind of an information dump today, but we have a lot of ground to cover. This is pretty much the base of everything we're going to be doing moving forward. Let's go for break, repeat, and next. So now we come back to yet another for loop. And this, thank God, is a little simpler than the ones we had before, even though they were not so too bad. I wouldn't say too bad, right? So I put in some comments here that should help you understand what they do. But break, for instance, works the following way. Suppose you have multiple loops inside one another, a loop in a loop in a loop in a loop. It's pretty much like inception here, right? So the thing is, you can use a break statement to break out the innermost loop to jump outside, to jump out again. It's kind of like this reference point again from the movie Inception you need, right? So for instance here, the next also tells you to go to the next statement. Simply just goes to the next. I put the comments up here. But for instance, in this for loop here, I say it goes from 1 to 100. Then it will simply say, hello. It will start with, you see here, if it is four, we skip. So I'm saying hello to all you are students up to number 42, except number four, because for some reason I don't like number four. This is how you would do. So you can say, if this condition is fulfilled, we just skip to the next one. That's what this next one does for you here. And otherwise it'll say print, hello, you are students, insert number, as you can see here in the output. It goes all the way up until 42, from which we will break out of the loop. We will stop. Very good one, Thomas. Probably that. So let's go on here. So now we can initialize one to be bound to the name X, right? Point it here. And then we can use a nice little repeat. So it will repeat until we hit a condition, the if condition here. This is just a very small example of how this could be done. I'm not going to dwell too long with this line here from 185 to 191. This is just so you have an example of it, okay? Not trying it to go way too fast, but then again, we have enough. So this is also a perfect time to just take a second. I'm going to go over here and ask the following question. I'm putting a question up here in the chat. So be ready, guys. Let's put up this one here. This is just for my own curiosity. Did you guys start an assignment too? You're gonna be honest, you got plenty of time left. Just wanna hear if anybody actually already gave it a go or gave it a look or actually started. I hopefully, if I would cast this vote here again after the practical on first day, the majority should hopefully be yes at that point. So this is just for my own curiosity, guys. No harm done if you haven't started at this point yet. 58 respondents, very good. Let's hide this one again and continue. This was a little intimate. So now we have LST apply functions. So now we're going to show a lot of different functions that are implemented already in R. So these are ways to get around having to write loops every single time, because sometimes you're like, hey, I don't need to write a loop because that already has a built in function for it. This refers perfectly to the question we had earlier in the chat. If R has a specific function already implemented, do I have to write a function myself? The answer is no, unless we tell you otherwise. We will be clear if that is the case. In this case here, look here starting at line 201. I first initialize a matrix, which for example, I'm just going to call M1. It's a five by six matrix, which is just filled with the numbers one to 10 over and over again. 
So three times I go one to 10, one to 10. What the supply function can do, it can, well, first of all, it helps us perform operations on matrices to avoid loops. That's in the most basic sense what it actually does. What it does here, you see here, it takes in the apply function, it takes in this case, three inputs. Actually, we can look at it a little further here to explain a little better what is going on. First of all, I should when have this automatic thing on, it's sometimes very annoying. Whoops. Ah, I should maybe learn to write question mark in front of it. My bad. There. Here. Here are our apply functions that we can use. Now, let me uh, take what the input is. You have three inputs in this one. X, margin, and fun. And um, I'm going to take the first one here and then have a break to, uh, well, continue. Haha. <laughs> Well, I don't think that was the question in the chat right now, but you can continue after break, for instance, if you're talking about loops. It would just break out of the innermost loop and go out to the next loop. This is referring to Jordy's comment in the chat, everybody who's watching. So let's go here. You take three inputs, X being the matrix that you want to put in, or the matrix, right? So you go red pill, blue pill, and you pick number two. Now, two here goes for the margin here, which you can see down here in the margin here. What is one and two? One indicates row, two indicates columns. So in our example here, we're using the apply columns over all the columns. So apply function all over all the columns. And what do we want to do? We want to sum each column. Okay. So if I run this here, I should get the sum of each individual column in this case. We can also double check. The first one is 15. Well, one plus two plus three plus four plus five is 15. I'm good with that. And, uh, I would also like to thank Nick at this point in the chat to remind me I cannot have any coffee right now. Reasons not disclosed right now. I'm just very sad. So, okay. We can of course also change this to go over the rows. So if I just do one instead here, run the code again, we get the sum of each of the rows instead. So just so you get the idea. We can of course, I'm just gonna change it back because otherwise I forget all of it again. So. That's just the basic apply function, which works on matrices. You can, of course, like also being called out here from Anastasia, also use call sum and row sum. And um, this is just to show an example of apply. So let me be very clear here. You can, of course, change this function to something else. It doesn't have to be sum. You can also take the averages of each row. You can also take the min of each row, the max of each row. So. This is just an example how apply works. We can, of course, extend this to be way more complicated, okay? So that is just a sum here, and we have, happen to have other functions. Sure. Let's go to the next one, which is, in this case, list apply. And what do I mean by list apply here? It's simply just apply, but also for lists. And now comes the question, what the hell is a list? So we learned atomic vector structures last time when we talked about character vectors, Boolean vectors, numeric vectors, uh, doubles, and so forth, right? Now, what is a list? You've all read the material for today, so you actually know, but here it goes again. List is actually a recursive data structure for so. And what it does, it can contain other values than just, you know, one type of value. A list can have an input that is a character. The next input could be a number, a numeric. The next one after that could be a Boolean. But more importantly, a list can contain another list inside itself, which is also why it may sometimes be named as a recursive vector. Let me just go for an example here. This is not list yet, but this is also just to explain what list apply works. I am going to introduce more lists later on, but now I already told you what is basically a list in a data structure sense. Let's initialize games. These are among some of the top games in the entire world. And... Um, I will not take this to any debate. This is just pure fact. Now, what I can do here, I can use L apply, so list apply to take this row of games and put them all to lowercase using to lower. So by doing this here, and then I print it out as a string. Then you can see here, I have all them as characters in this case here, as lowercase, so Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, Twilight Princess, Scarlet Sword, or Breath of the Wild. And that's how very simplistic way of using L apply. So just introducing things here, and then we continue. I'm going to finish up with all these apply functions here, and then we take a break. That is a better place to take a break. So I'm going to continue with s apply. And s apply is basically the same as l apply, 
but it just returns a vector instead of a list. So vectors we know all about because we introduced them last week and you did very good assignments about it again. Well done, guys, with an average above eight. You guys are awesome. So look here. First, I'm going to initialize a data set that is hidden inside R, just like a standard trial data set, which is called cars. So I'm just going to put in cars and I call it DT. So let's look at it first. It's 50 observations, which is about, what do we have here? Minimum speed and stopping distances of cars. So you see the first column is about the speed and then the distance here. These dollar signs here is just to initiate what position in the list. So uh, I'm being questioned in the uh, chat here from me Yule, or me Joel. Let's do that. It's better. These dollar signs here, when you call a list here, these dollar signs just initiate each point of the list. So you're going to see this way more when you're going to work with list, how these dollar signs actually work. It's also an advanced R book under the same section as subsetting. So it just refers to a subset of the list. Shortest way to say it. We can use L apply and S apply just so you can see the difference. We're doing exactly the same, but they will present itself in two different ways. So I can, of course, just use these two functions, same inputs. We want to get the minimum of each one of them. And now you can see how they report each of the things. First off, if you use L apply, it will give you a list which looks like this. Dollar sign denotes the position in the list. Again, referring to a question in the chat. So, and the other one return it as a vector, as you saw last week when you have these numbers in the vector and you have a name tied to each of these entries in the vector. So there's also just what columns are in this data matrix that I now have loaded in. You can, of course, also do it with a maximum because now we just put a minimum. So now I just do the maximum speed and stopping distance. Exactly the same. I just changed the functional min to max. Okay. I now have the final thing here in this section here. It's going a little fast, I know. But luckily, we can always watch this back as many times as you need to. Hmm. We can, of course, also just make a function because, well, today is function day or this is function week. We can make a function that returns, in this case, the average of the cars. So let me look at it here. I have a nice little function here, which for, of course, for style reasons, I should do like that, which, of course, the average here, this function here will help us return the average using s apply. This is to show that you can also, as an argument to s apply or l apply for that matter, use a homemade function. It doesn't have to be a function that only exists already in R. So you can initialize your own average function, which I've done here. It simply just takes lowest, highest divided by two, which is how we find averages. We learned that back in, I don't know what grade you learned in, but it's long ago for all of us. And then we see here, we can use s apply to call out the average by f cars. So let me do that. So we get the averages of each column, given an average speed of 14 and a half. I am assuming this is in miles, by the way. And then here we have a stopping distance of 61. What that is in, I don't know. Feet, maybe. Okay, so I have here the very final in the whole apply class we had regular apply, we had L apply, S apply, what else do we add? S, L, and now we also have T apply. That's the final one. This one here is a little more interesting. Why? <clears throat> oh, this is actually a good point to take a question from the chat because so we have a chat here from MV. So you can always use S apply or not for lists. It's just depending on what it returns. So I'm going to just leave it with that. No, it's not the answer you want, but I'll leave it with that. But in general, yes, you can off, often go with that. And also a comment here from Anastasia. Indeed, favorite is values without units, so you can actually make up your own stuff. But okay. Let's load in the final little data set here that is also hidden in R. R has a nice variety of different data sets that you can use for practicing. And in this case here, I load in a data set Iris. And in this case here, it will give us all this information on different kinds of flowers. So let me see what I got here. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, what is this? 
let's start with this. This data set is just, I would call a flower data set. It contains values of different kinds of flowers. It comes with different types of width, species, how long they are, and how well how each of these types of flowers are. This example here will return a subset of this entire data set that is in here, because the data set is rather big. And it will return a subset only giving us, for each of these different types here, it will give us the median value, which you can see here. And now here you see how you call different things inside the data set. It's not going to be super important this week, but for looking forward, this is also good to know. What do we do? We use T apply. We take the input from the iris data set. You use dollar sign to initiate or to tell, I want this part of the data set, which is the width of these kind of uh, flowers. Then again, we use from iris dollar sign, what are the species for these different species? So we divide it over these three here. So we want the median width from these different species, spe species, spe species. Wow. Okay. That was my cue for a break, guys. So I will go on a break and we will see each other back here. Let's just make it at, at 12. Not gonna, it's going to be a short break, I know, but then we can also finish a little earlier, right? So I'll see you back at 12, guys. Until then. And welcome back from the little break we had here so we can finish up today's lecture. I asked in the break here how many times you watched lecture one back just to, you know, give a feel for how useful it is to actually make the lecture available instead of just having it live once and then, you know, go. So just to get an idea for it, uh, not that I'm thinking about not doing it, I just want to know how important this is. Um, in terms of uh, making the lecture scripts available beforehand, um, um, that's fine. I could do that, but it should come with a caveat that if something happens during the lecture and needs to be updated, of course they will be updated. So I hope that will be understandable. So I could put up the scripts if that is something people would like. Um, okay. So uh, that should also cover the things that was found in the chat here for the questions here. Um, let's uh, just uh, keep going. We got a few more things to cover and now let's go to our first simulation example of this course. So starting with this, we're going to go simple and we're just going to throw a dice, a nice six sided dice, like one, like, let me put an example up for you for everybody who's living under a rock who doesn't know what a dice is a nice little six sided one like this one. This one is made of amethyst, so I shouldn't break it. Then my wife will kill me. But very nice. Put them up there. Okay. So, we are going to throw a lot of dice and uh, we are going to see, okay, great guys. Um, how are we going to store all this output? Because what are we going to do? We're going to simply just test the law of large numbers. For those who don't know law of large numbers, um, well, look it up in your textbook. You probably heard about it from probability theory, but just in case you have not, uh, then uh, yeah, you can go check it out. Otherwise, uh, it's even on my channel. I make fun of it in, in when I play Pokemon cards against one of my friends. We also test the law of large numbers, how it works on the Pokemon client that you play on online. Answer is it works pretty okay. But you could check it out if you want to see it. So, what are we going to do here? We're going to also use as an example of how to store a lot of output. And this is where we can use all this list structure, for instance. So, for instance, we want to make a hundred dice rows. Like, let's make it a little simple for ourselves and let's clean out a little bit here so we have an empty environment to start with here. Okay, first, we're going to set initialize n to be 100. So we throw dice 100 at a time. We're going to set up a nice little matrix here, which is, of course, just full of nothing right now. And then it's going to have, let's look at it, it's going to have three columns. And then it's going to be for 100 long, so 100 rows, essentially. Right, so let's go check this out. What we can do now to be able to replicate our simulation the same time every time, that's why we use set seed as explained last week. So I'm gonna use set seed 42 because as we all know, that's the answer to everything. And then what we can do here, we can do a double loop. So what we are essentially doing here, we're doing for each of the three columns from one to a hundred, we are sampling all these dice rows. That's what we're doing. So we're basically moving through this matrix one by one. So 
One loop will go over the columns, the other loop will go over each of the rows. And that's how we can fill out all this via this double loop structure. So let's run it. And then we can go back and look at our dice matrix. And now you can see it has been nicely filled out with all our dice rows from 1 to 100. And of course with three rows, so there's a 300 rolls in this matrix here. This is a quick way of conducting 300 dice rolls. You could also, of course, sit there and do a pen and paper yourself, but um, I like to save a little time, right? We can, of course, do a little more efficient using just a sample function as introduced last week. But now you can also see a version using just loop structures to fill out this. You can, of course, assemble using this with, of course, replacement equal true because, well, it's not as if you pull off the six when you roll the six. That's not how this works. And the comment on in the chat here, yeah, when, uh, when Corona allows, I do play D&D once in a while. My wife joins as well because um, she likes to throw her pretty dice. That's pretty much it. And uh, get a character that excuse you to drink a lot of beer is also fine by me. So I'm good with that. Um, let's go to a following example. Well, it's just an extension of what we just did. Because right now we just did a lot of dice rows. But we can do it even more efficient. We can do it with even bigger sets of data. So what we can do here, I'm going to set the same seat. You can, of course, of course, choose whatever seat you want. That's fine by me. No problems there. We're going to be rolling 10,000 times. That's what we're going to do this 10,000 times. The increments is going to be done by 100, and then we're going to run it n divided by 100 steps. So we're going to do this. Well, let's remove two rows there. We do this 100 times. Each time, we increment the number of rolls by 100. That means the first time we're going to roll, we roll 100 dice. The second time we're going to roll, we roll 200. The third time, 300, 400, 500, and so forth, all the way up to 10,000. Doing so, we can illustrate the law of large numbers. How the probability of rolling a 6 should, yeah, a 6 for instance, should converge to, well, 1 over 6, as you may have guessed, providing that it's a fair die, of course. So let's first initialize these here. Boom, boom, boom. Here we can of course use the list structure that I already explained. So here you can just use the help function to see what the hell is a list, but I already explained that. So we're going to skip that one and then instead we go to declare this list. This is going to be our dice list. So opening this up here, we see a list with 100 different entries here. This is how a complete empty list of size 100 would look like. Let's uh, close these up again a little. We don't need them all open. And then we can, of course, starting now with a loop to fill out this list with all our dice throws. So we start with K and then we move for a counter B and we move in sequence from 100 increasing by or 100 up to 10,000 increasing by 100 at the time. Like I said, we roll 100 the first time, then 200, then 300 and so forth. And you simply fill out this dice matrix this way. So if I run this here, it's still running a little bit, as you can see. Now I have now a large list with 100 elements. Each of these elements consists of these increasing number of dice throws. Uh, I've got a question here, which goes on this from MV. Should the lines 3 to 307 be in the function area, or does that not matter? This is just, this is not a function I'm writing, writing now here. This is just a loop to do it. I could, of course, put this inside a function do, but this is not a function. It's just a loop to simulate something. So not a function right now. Sorry for the confusion for MV. Okie dokie. So now let's take a look at this list now. It's a very large list and you can see this is a list with 100 elements, 100 doubles, there's 200 doubles, 300 doubles, and here are all the results in the list if we want to look at it. Not going to go that way, but now believe me when I say what is in it. All these different dice rows that took you days and days to roll because you didn't believe in loops. We can, of course, also just pick out just one place in that list, which is number three. And we can just look at point three in this list. Oh, I got a nice question in the chat from uh, Moose. That's how we pronounce it. Moose 99. And what is B? That is just a counter. Remember earlier I just used I? Well, now I just used B. Next time I can use set. Anything. Just a counter. Oh, that is clear. 
awesome. And then you can see how I construct this dice list here. But this doesn't yet show us how well this approached the law of large numbers. We need to construct the fractions of sixes here. Okay, that's how we want to do here. And well, I got a nice question here from Supermax1112, one, uh, 1, if you want the whole name. How do we check if it works properly? Well, run it, try it, debug it, see if it runs. Like for instance, now I ran here and then you can see I'm checking each of the positions to check, does it contain what I expect? That's simply how you would do it, at least in this case here. Keep it simple for now. Now, we need a fraction here, which is going to be another matrix that's going to display the fraction of these, well, sixes, right? So in this case here, I got this matrix here that contains two columns. It has 100 rows and just filled it with zeros for now because we are to fill it out with our results. It's going to be filled out with a number of dice rows that was made and the proportion of sixes that you rolled. So now you can see you can fill it out here. You see, we fill out all these, this matrix frac, I called it. We fill it out with the mean number of sixes from our dice matrix, the big dice list we did earlier. And I also fill out with the length here indicating, well, how many rolls were made. Notice here the double square brackets. That is also subsetting in R, also explained in the advanced R book for this course. How you would access a specific element in a matrix, for instance. So now, if I run this here, I'm going to fill out this matrix, which runs pretty quick. And now I can look at this matrix. It shows here in column number one, the fraction of sixes that I rolled. And this, of course, goes for like 0, 13. So 13% roughly was a six. And you see this was for 100 throws, then 200, 300, and so forth. It goes all the way up till 10,000 throws, where you see at the end, the fraction here is 0, 16, 19, and a lot of zeros. Now, how can we see how this goes over time. Let's plot it. Let's make our first plot using the basic plot package in R. We're going to extend on this with some more cool plot features later, but for now, we're just going to use the simple built-in plot function in R, which is just called plot. Wow, right? So let's do this. We're going to plot, well, this column, and we're going to plot these two columns here. So you have the number versus, well, this fraction of sixes, right? We want it as a line type, and then we give the label on the x-axis just a number of draws. In this case, it should actually be a number of dice rolls, if you want to be correct. And the label on the y-axis, the frequency. And then we just put color red, and then we put some limits here on the y. Let's just see what happens. When I run it, it comes down in my little plot area here. So what this actually shows, if I now put in a nice little line here that represents the theoretical probability, because remember, you have the theoretical probability, which you should... Over time, as the sample size increases, you should converge to this number. This is also what is also talked about the whole law of large numbers and convergence in terms of whether this is the weak law or the strong law. More explained in my fun video if you want to see me look stupid also. But look here. This illustrates perfectly as the number increases, you see the fluctuations become less and less and it somewhat converges to this theoretical probability of one over six. I could explain, I could extend this, of course, to a million, for instance, it would take a little while to run, but then it should hopefully over time converge even closer with less fluctuations. Well, if it, the law of large numbers holds in this case. And this is what we can see here. What we're going to do now as a final thing here, and I would like to uh, thank again, Nick, for reminding me that I'm not drinking coffee right now. I'm very sad about that dentist told me no. So, yeah. We can now, of course, around this fraction here, we can put, well, confidence intervals. We learned that in statistics, and hopefully you did. Otherwise, well, you're in for some surprise. So, on line 341 and 342, we're going to add two additional lines around this, where, of course, we get the probability fraction here. No, not at all. I'm just drinking chocolate milk because the nectar of the gods and nobody can tell me otherwise. <laughs> so we get the fraction here, which we're going to call P hat. And then we get the standard deviation, which we calculate as well. And then, of course, we take the other vector here, which is the number of draws. Let's initialize those things and then put in one line that goes above 
I put a green because, well, red, green, then we can see that here. And then I've put in the line below here to put in the other one here. This will represent the confidence intervals around this, well, probability from our simulation. And of course, we can make it a little cleaner, our table here, if we want to make it a really nice plot. We can, of course, add some title and we can also add a little more explanation. You can see here, I add a nice title here with the confidence intervals, 95%, which is the standard percentage we use normally in statistics. Of course, we also have one in 10%, but now we just keep it at five. Look here, we've showed this the estimate with the confidence bounds around. So this here represents a very nice graph we just built using our simple plot package. We can, of course, extend this greatly using more sophisticated plotting packages like ggplot, which we're going to do later. But for now, this is how you would do a simple plot in R. You will be able to play around with this yourself here afterwards, after I upload this here after lecture, or go online at one. Okay. We got one short simulation left, and that will be the end of today's class. So we have our gold bar, or rather the polluted gold bar example here. What is the case? Because it's very realistic, you have now 100 pounds of gold on you. And no, you're not selling it. Instead, you're melting it down to 100 small one pound gold bars each. Or you can say one kilo bars, for instance, if you want to do that way instead. You melt them down. However, there's some mistake. Somebody messed up somewhere and there's 50 pieces of, well, inferior metals. Tin, iron, brawn, whatever. Inferior metals compared to gold, right? That has been randomly spread all over these gold bars. And the question is, what is the expected number of gold bars that doesn't contain any of these pieces? And remember here, of course, one gold bar can have more than one piece. Otherwise, the answer will be simply just, well, half. That's not exactly correct. So now, the, my question to you, before I run this simulation, place your bets in the chat. How many gold bars do you think do not contain any inferior metals? Go. Round it to whole numbers, please. Of these 100 gold bars I'm going to make, how many are going to be clean? And we have a very strong opening bet with 42 coming in. In the meanwhile, I'm going to explain a little what's going on here. Then you can place your bets. We set the seed so we can, uh, well, replicate this randomness every time. We have the number of polluted bars. We have the number of actual bars. And we have how many simulations we're going to run. We run, of course, 10,000. That's a good number. I could just increase it, but for now, we run it 10,000 times. Look at it here. First, we initialize, well, this matrix again, which will contain all the bars that are clean. So for each simulation, how many bars are clean? And then we see, well, how many are the average number of clean bars after all these here? And let's look at it here. We run a for loop that goes over the number of simulations of 1 to 10,000. Then we say, okay, how many polluted bars do we have? We sample between 1 and 100 50 times with replacement, because like I said, one bar of gold can have more than one piece of inferior metal in it. That's why we have it with replacement. And then, of course, we say here, what is the number of bars without such inferior metals? Well, that's the number of bars minus the length of this num unique number of polluted bars. What does this unique do? That's a function R that gives you the subset of unique values. Indeed, it sorts away if you have any duplicates. In this case, uh, if uh, one or more bars have one or more of these inferior metals. And then, of course, we can just take the mean of this bars without and we get the value. So I'm going to look at the bets that's been placed. 42, 67, 69, 1, 7, 49, 15, and 24. I can say that uh, in this case here, I believe that 67 and 69 and such are quite close, if I'm not mistaken. The number here is round it down to 60. That is the whole number that it is, 60%. Or in this case, 60.5% if you want to be a little more precise, or 60.4856. This, of course, can also just be done via probability theory this way is here. And this will also converge to 16 and a half because you all have probability theory and it was a fantastic course. I know, I think it's a really great course. It's not easy, I recognize that. But you all had it, so you all knew the probabilistic uh, theory behind this here. That shows two simulations that we did here. And I strive for it for the end of each lecture. From now on, I'm gonna show you different simula simulations showing different kinds of 
problems we try to solve. Um, this is also why I normally did not put up the lecture script on front because, well, then I can't make these kind of things. That's not fun, right? But um, if you guys want the lecture script up, I'll let me know. So with this set here, I would like to end today's lecture. And thank you very much for your attention. Been a good crowd today. And I hope you will start soon on assignment number two. And best of luck. And until next time. <laughs>